One Emotional Podcast, Conversations for Inspiration on the Go. We offer on-the-go inspiration because our whole heart is set on beauty and our best bets are set on art. Hola, 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 perfecto. <clears throat> Hello, welcome everyone to this new episode of Luan Emotional Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to talk about adult children of emotionally immature parents. So we're going to discuss what happens when a child has emotionally immature parents, and especially how do you recognize it and heal it yourself? Because understanding what emotionally immature parents look like gives you the power to judge for yourself the level of relationship you can have with them or anyone really. So you have the ability to better create boundaries with ease and focus on living from a true, authentic space, rather than spending tons of time and energy on a parent who won't change. So this episode is based on Lindsay Gibson's book, Idle Children of Emotional Immature Parents. And I chose this topic because I think it's something that's quite worthy to give a bit of space and discuss how important it is for when a child is growing up to have emotionally mature parents. And if it's the case of that child that happens that, you know, their parents are not emotionally mature, then eventually what can that person do and heal from that? Okay. So understanding what an emotionally mature parent looks like gives you the power to judge for yourself the level of relationship you can have with them or anyone. So you have the ability to create boundaries with ease and focus on living from a true authentic space rather than spending tons of time and energy on a parent who won't change. The truth is emotional neglect, emotional neglect is not about you. It's the level they are at and has nothing to do with your worth, even though children of emotionally immature parents feel that it has everything to do with our unworthiness. So each of us has a unique journey and some may be at different stages of development. So part of our, pro of our purpose is to accept and give space to people to be where they are and allow ourselves to keep moving forward and grow. So I do believe that when you stay open to healing wounds and understanding your triggers, then, you know, life or the universe or God or however you want to call it, it gives you exactly what you need to achieve it. Okay, so let's start with the main topic. Well, who are emotionally mature parents? What makes an emotionally mature parent? So emotionally immature parents are the ones that are afraid of emotional intimacy and often pull back or resist genuine emotional closeness. So children often feel painful emotional loneliness because of this. Even if they were well taken care of physically or maybe verbally told they were loved, that doesn't mean their emotional needs were met. So emotional loneliness is a sign that, as it's, a, it's a sign that they haven't had enough emotional intimacy with other people. And without this crucial emotional intimacy, various symptoms and behaviors can arise. Some children believe putting other people's needs first is the price they have to pay to be in a relationship and then they can copy, they can learn that from their parents, and then they can copy it and continue doing it in different relationships that they have. No? Both, um, we could have an example of both parents growing up in an emotionally mature homes so then eventually it also, it has to do with their parents and their parents and their parents and so on. And as we've seen, you know, for example, there were sometimes, for example, from our uh, parents, it was more about um, having this a hard education, right? Of, you know, not being open and not being, you know, emotional and not open about your feelings. And maybe our parents' parents, no? 
they were more about discipline, kind of like discipline was the most important thing. So a well-disciplined kid meant the success of the parents. And then it goes on and on in our lineage and in our, you know, background. And nowadays we're more open to address the emotional needs of our children. And that is something quite important. And so what is emotional intimacy? So, well, for example, when we feel anger or frustration, sometimes it can, be, it can come from a lack of understanding. When we don't understand why we feel certain ways about our parents, it can add to not so good feelings in the mix, kind of like feeling guilty. But once you start to understand better, it can humanize them and hopefully give you the tools you need to decide how you want to move forward in the relationship. So, um, what's typically missing in a relationship with an immature parent is emotional intimacy. And here's how Lindsay Gibson describes emotional intimacy. So, emotional intimacy involves knowing that you have someone you can tell anything to. Okay, I quote her. Someone to go to with all your feelings about anything and everything. You feel completely safe opening up to the other person, whether in the form of words, through an exchange of looks, or by just being together quietly in a state of connection. Emotional intimacy is profoundly fulfilling, creating a sense of being seen and heard for who you really are. It can only exist when the other person seeks to know you and not to judge you. So you might be listening to this podcast and I wonder, have you, feel, have you ever felt that you were not heard? Have you ever felt that you've never been taken into consideration? Have you ever felt that you're not seen? So all of these, you know, characteristics can have to do with emotionally immature parents. And with these emotionally immature parents, they don't notice their child's inner experiences. They often, they often fear emotional intimacy because they're uncomfortable with their own emotional needs. And therefore, they can provide fulfillment of their child's needs. So such parents may even become nervous and angry if their children get upset, punishing them instead of comforting them. So it's a typical example when a kid is crying and instead of the parent kind of like, hey, what's wrong? What happened today at school? Tell me all about it. Are you hurt? Are you feeling sad? Share those feelings with me. Then the parent, if it's an emotional, immature parent, could um, could say that, for example, um, like, hey, like punishing, like, stop crying. It's not fair that you come to the house and are crying, and I'm trying to work, and I'm trying to have my things over here, and please stop crying, and you punish that person. Okay, so that's, for example, a quite easy example to understand. Okay, so what are the symptoms from having emotionally immature parents? Okay, so what does it look like to be affected by emotionally immature parents? So some signs are that you first feel that you've never truly belonged to any group, as if you are an outsider looking in. Second, you get shut down your emotions instead of listening to them. Three. You settle for emotional loneliness in relationships because that's what you're used to in your family upbringing. Four, um, you play whatever role you believe your parent wants you to play to try and strengthen the connection. Four, don't believe someone would want to have a relationship with you purely because of who you are, that you must always put them first to earn that place, okay? Five, um, I'm sorry, six, I feel guilty for feeling sad or down, even if everything on the outside looks good. Seven, lack of confidence that others could be interested in you or that you could lack talents. Lack of confidence is super common in this emotionally immature parenthood. And last one, feel like, like a bother for telling someone else your needs, any kind of needs, Okay. So um, we could do an assessment that comes in the book that you can fill out for each parent or step parent you have. So to keep things condensed, uh, we're going to name a few signs of emotionally mature parents, but these are, you know, hardly everything, you know, there's more, obviously. But one of them is not validating your feelings and instincts. 
Another one is overreaction to minor things. A third one is lack of empathy or awareness. Four is saying or doing things without thinking of others' feelings. Low stress tolerance. Being in good system, sometimes wise, and sometimes completely unreasonable. Conversation centers always on the parent's interest or stories, bringing it back to them. Facts and logics were no match for their opinion. It's like they have their own different opinion and what, that's what they do. Huh? Black and white thinkers are not, are not open to new ideas. They can become very successful when there's a clear path in front of them. But when moments require emotional decisions, they can be either rigid or impulsive and close their minds to other ideas, becoming quite defensive when people have different ideas in them. And they constantly do what feels best. Okay, um, I want to dig down a little bit more in the low stress tolerance, meaning they're reactive and unable to anticipate the future instead of using coping me mechanisms. So they, for example, they can deny, they can distort, they can replace reality, they can manipulate. Okay, so regulating emotions is tough for them and it's often hard to calm down after getting upset. And the book... Um, talks about internalizers and externalizers. I'm going to dig a little bit more into these because it's quite fascinating, okay? So um, Gibson talks about four types of immature parents, which you can read more in the book. Okay? But I want to share with you two coping styles that children of those immature parents tend to fall into, okay? Internalizers and externalizers. When you have immature parents, you're forced as a kid to adjust to their limitations. Obviously, you wouldn't be aware of it, but kids want to feel that emotional void and feel it's their fault. That's up to them to fix it. And that it is up to them to feel noticed, cared for, and engaged with. And if they're not being noticed, cared, or engaged with, then kids feel that it's their fault. That's when the creation of a healing fantasy comes into play. So. The child imagines what would make them feel better and often think they need to change themselves to do it. So you can, um, it's important to understand the difference between this and the coping mechanisms because they all rob us of the vitality of our true selves. And this is quite an important topic in Iran because, you know, we work with a lot of artists and part of being an artist is, you know, kind of like validating your true self, touching and being in contact with, you know, who you are in your truest form. And you can't forge a deep and satisfying relationship from the position of a real self. You have to be able to express enough of your true self to give the other person something to relate to. Without that, the relationship is just play acting between two real selves, okay? So let's get to the coping styles of children with emotionally immature parents. And uh, the first one is the internalizers. So some qualities of the internalizers are the following. First one, mentally active and love to learn new things. Number two, problem solving happens from the inside out. They self-reflect and try to learn from mistakes. Three, they're super sensitive. Four, they try to understand cause and effect. Five, life is seen as a chance to develop themselves. They enjoy becoming more competent. Next one, they believe making things better depends on trying harder. Also, their biggest sources of guilt and anxiety are when they think they've displeased others or fear being exposed as an imposter. And last one, their biggest relationship downfall. It's overly self-sacrificing and then resenting how much they have done. Now we're going to dig down into the e externalizers, okay? The externalizers, in this case, um, children who externalize their problems believe it's up to others to change things. So here are some qualities of, of uh, externalizers. Number one, take action before they think. Number two, they're reactive and take impulsive action to alleviate anxiety. Number three, they're not a self-reflective and assign blame to other people or circumstances rather than themselves. Four, 
Life is a process of trial and error, but rarely use their mistakes as a way to do better. Okay. Five, they're seeing, they, they see their happiness as a dependent on change happening in the outside world, not internally. Six, their coping style is often so destructive, others have to step in and repair the damage. Seven, they feel like victims are like competent people, owe them help, and that good comes to the other unfairly. Eight, they either have super low self-confidence or a sense of inflated superiority. Nine, since they depend on external soothing, they can be susceptible to abuse, addictions, and immediate gratifications. 10, their biggest source of anxiety being cut off from the external sources that give them security. And the last one, their biggest relationship downfall. It's being attracted to impulsive people and being overly depending on others for support and stability. Okay, so I'm going to read that again. For the internalizers, okay, the, their biggest relationship downfall is overly self-sacrificing and then resenting how much they've done. And their biggest relationship downfall for the externalizers are being attracted to impulsive people and being overly dependent on others for support and stability. Okay? So, what's the cure for emotional loneliness, right? If you have an emotional immature parent, odds are that you are, you, you have been growing up with an emotional loneliness, okay? And um, emotional loneliness is a term that suggests its own cure. Being on the receiving end of another person's sympathetic interest in what you're feeling. So for emotional connection, it needs to be with someone who's interested in really understanding you and your experience. Okay? So if you start listening to your emotions and allowing them space to exist, then you allow your emotional needs to be known. You can have a genuine connection with others, allowing them to show up and be there for you. Okay? So, this helps a lot. So, the description provided about becoming observational has helped me tremendously. Okay? So, here are the steps. Number one is to center yourself. This is kind of like the antidote of feeling emotional loneliness. Okay? Number one is center yourself. Number two, notice a name. Focus on observing the other person and your internal reaction. Number three, remind yourself to detach. If you're still, you know, getting triggered and it is necessary, okay? This is like a meditation. So this kind of like gives you the tools to feel much better equipped to stay balanced around emotional immature parents. And then you can do some affirmations. I allow myself to be who I truly am and interact in the world as a healed and whole self. So I want to ask you, are you an internalizer or an externalizer? Is it something that you kind of like um, connected with, something that actually helped, you know, kind of like trigger? Because we need to attend the emotional needs that we had as a child. And if you didn't have emotionally mature parents, it's okay. There are many things that you can do starting right now. And that is to become your own mother and your own parent inside. What would you have liked emotionally to feel with your parents and start giving that to yourself right now? So, and we're going to keep on discussing this because for artists it's quite important to have that emotional connection because when we create art many times we're connected with our emotions and if we've been brought up in a home where there was emotional neglect where the most important thing was to run away from your emotions to not be able to share them then eventually how are we going to connect with our creative genius how are we going to create to connect with our creative energy how are we going to start, you know, creating our art? How are we going to communicate our talents if we cannot be in touch with our most basic and human emotions? 
So this topic is quite important for anyone that's creating anything in their lives. So in the next episode, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this emotional needs. I hope you enjoyed this episode and see you next time. Want to keep the conversation going? Luan, the world's first emotional museum, designed a global online experience to inspire and explore. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, Telegram, and visit our site at luanmuseum.com to engage creatively.